and chat. How's it going, guys? Welcome to the ExileCon stream. Um, Path of Exile is having its convention where it's doing announcements about uh, Path of Exile 2 and the upcoming league. And I am excited to see what's going on. Uh, I have been a big Path of Exile fan since 2014 when I started playing back in Beyond League. God, I'm coming up on almost a decade of playing Path of Exile. I've fallen off the past few leagues because I've had other stuff going on. Uh, and the leagues haven't particularly interested me that much. But, um, oh my god, I love this game so much. I If they announce a closed beta for Path of Exile 2 and I get in... Which I may, because I've got a lot of money sent in for supporter packs over the past 10 years. Um, I will definitely stream the start of Path of Exile 2. And if I don't get into the closed beta, I'll stream Path of Exile 2 when it comes out. I'm excited. Even if nobody watches, I will be playing Path of Exile 2. Uh, let me unmute this. They're having a... Bay class or something? Oh, that's why Mathel's not streaming. He's actually on stage. Whoops, that's not the unmute. Predictions? I really at this point, I just, I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe an MTX. I would like to see a toucan. Huh? No, a toucan. Yeah, no, a toucan. <laughs> Come on, right, Nuki. Right. I, I would just love to see a nervous Chris Wilson up on stage. Yes. Yeah. Like for as much nerves as I'm oh, having right now. Like my this, God. This sort of thing. Chris was like, terrified at ExileCon 2019. They like, set an Einhar actor like, out to yeah. buy time because he was so right scared. I know they're all um, super excited and needed the time to compose himself. Oh man, but it. Once he got out there, it went off without a hitch. Absolutely amazing event. Yeah, absolutely, Dad. I mean, everybody from the GGG side has felt really, really excited. We were trying to get them drunk at some of the parties. They weren't having it. They're well trained. Ah, nice spoilers. They weren't giving us anything. That's good, though. More so than last time, even. Also, I've. I've got to remind you folks, if you're watching live on Twitch, don't forget to connect your Twitch and Path of Exile account so you can get drops access to... Um, was there like a cool hideout or something like that? Or do we only get that? I don't know if I'm teasing. There were some really nice wings. And yeah. There are wings in yeah, a portal. I so, but yeah, the and I have the... I have yeah, so make Path sure of Exile... Up. The Path yeah, of Exile stream to, up uh, in a uh, Firefox uh, window uh, where I'm logged in so I can get those. Thanks for hanging out with us for the stall. Cast, I'm Ziggy D with Mathel. Stall right. cast, cute. Back over here, just after the keynote is finished. There is not much time left, so we'll see you fine folks over there in just a moment. Thank you very much. Two minutes! Oh, I'm excited. Oh, we got cosplayers in the uh, in the audience. Is that a Mike Wazowski hat? That's an odd thing to wear to Exile Con. One minute. Oh, oh, I'm excited. Oh, man. So what do you think? Are we getting Boat League? Oh, that countdown can't go fast enough. It's crawling by 30 seconds. Fifteen. Six. 
five, four, three, two, one. Can you guys hear it fine? Uh, how's the audio level compared to me? How's it going? Perry in here. Crip? And welcome to Exocon! They brought Crip out Thank for this? Thank you so much for joining us here in New Zealand. It's quite a journey. Thank you guys for joining us online. It's going to be a fantastic show. Um, so, uh, you guys want to learn about what's coming up in Path of Exile? Oh, you do? Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, before we get to the people that are best to deliver that information, before we get into Path of Exile's wonderful future, let's take a moment to go over all the wonderful things we have already experienced in Path of Exile. Let's take a moment to check out Path of Exile from the past. Oh man, it was ru wow. The Brutus model was basically unchanged from 2010 to like 2017. Oh, Talisman was rough. I miss Navali. I miss Prophecy. That league kept me sane when I was... Um, when I was on some... Antidepressant medicine that responded... I responded very badly to. The Year of Masters was very hype. Leading up to Betrayal League. Can't believe it's been four years since Legion. Four years since Blight, too. Damn. Heist, the level of detail in lore and character work in Heist was incredible. Your path to greatness has taken a hard turn toward a cliff. I didn't get to play much of Ultimatum, which is a shame because apparently it was incredible. I'm so glad they went back on the Arch Nemesis changes. You cannot escape me, that's case. The new monster designs for Path of Exile 2 are so good! Oh, that's... that's a hefty encounter. Creatures. 
So who is this new character? Is there going to be character customization in Path 2? Are they replacing some of the character models? Are there a different set of Exile models if you do the Path of Exile 2 um, campaign? Hey, there's Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. <laughs> there's our boy. Welcome to Exocon 2023. It feels like just yesterday that I was here on stage at Exocon 2019 announcing Path of Exile 2. Since then, we are Oh, he's panicking again. on the content we're going to show you this weekend. To everyone here in person, thank you so much for coming out to join us. It honestly feels so good to know that people love Path of Exile so much that they fly across the world to come and celebrate it with us in person here. I really I wish I could go to Exocon. I am way too poor. Our last Exocon was a magical experience, and we've tried to go above and beyond in every way this time. If you're tuning in online to watch the live stream, thanks for joining us also. I wish you could all be with us here, but to ensure you have the full Exocon experience, we have made sure to include every talk and session as part of the two-day live stream this weekend. Twitch drops are enabled for the live stream, but if you're here in the audience, you'll automatically get them when you redeem the microtransaction code in your swag bag. So no need to stream it from your phones while you're watching. Is there an exclusive you'll portal this time? The attendee only Exocon 2023 hideout. A hideout. To share with you this weekend and oh. get right into Path of Exile 2. I'd oh like man. I want Lewis that. I'm Robert. so mad I don't get that. Oh, if I could get that. Oh. Hey guys. While Chris has been running Path of Exile 1, Mark and I and over 100 other developers have been hard at work on PoE 2. And honestly, the project has become much bigger than we expected when we announced it in 2019. It's been almost four years since then, and so it's about time we showed you what we've been working on. Oops, hang on. <laughs> Okay. When we sorry, I forgot. About, okay. When we announced Path of Exile 2 at Exilecon 2019, we told you guys that we were releasing it as an expansion to PoE 1, and that both campaigns would be playable in the same game client at a, at, with a shared end game. Let that be the true. Still, the scope has continued to grow and grow, and it's far more than just an expansion with a new campaign. It has entirely new monsters, skills, mechanics, classes, everything you'd expect from the next generation of action RPGs. Not to mention revamps of most of the PoE 1 League content. This thing is Ooh. just freaking huge. There was a point Big where we our plan to replace POE 1 with POE 2 would essentially be getting rid of a game that people love for no real reason. So we made a decision. Path of Exile 1 and 2 will be separate with their own mechanics, balance, end games, and leagues. But it's still a shared platform. Your microtransactions are available across both games. Everything you have ever purchased or will ever purchase in the future will be usable in both okay. games, unless it's hyper-specific to the content of one of them. You can't transform into a bear in POE 1, so a reskin of your bear form isn't going to work. Okay, as if if your MTX is carrying over, that's fine, right? Like, love to show you a live demo of some of the stuff we've been working. That's Poe Two has come a long way. Mark here is going to manage. It means they can keep managing Poe One. They're going to have to put a lot of resources into maintaining both games at once. Maybe they'll put Poe One on life support and stop getting new leagues. Ooh, that's a little distressing. The gods caused all this, you know. After Oriath was destroyed, I traveled, searching for answers. Everywhere I went, the same divine devastation. It must end. I will end it. And no exile will stop me. All right, um, uh, I kind of agree with her. Warrior Huntress, new classes. How many new classes are there?
Oh, that's a cool monster. The prisoner. Okay, well, okay, so they're taking advantage of it being a new game by having so many more classes. Oh, that starfish is creepy. The monster design in Path of Exile 2 is top-notch. Freaky! Careful. That mermaid had her titties out. No matter the cost. Yo, I'm kind of with the villain there. The gods are bastards and they caused all this devastation. I wonder how they're going to justify her being in the wrong. We'd like to start off by showing you some of the gameplay of Act 3, one of the six acts in Pee Wee 2's campaign. We're starting here in the jungle depths. Act 3 is set in the ruins of the Vile Civilization, which fell thousands of years ago. Jungle has taken over their former once great cities, and we'll be exploring it use, using one of the six new character classes called the Monk. In Pee Wee 1, we had one character class for each of the combinations of strength, dexterity, and intelligence. When looking at the design of Pee Wee 2, though, we realized that many of the new skills that we were trying to design just didn't really fit thematically with the existing classes that we have. Being a spellcaster with a bear form makes sense for Strength Int, but it just doesn't really sound like something a Templar would do. We realized that since we had new mechanics for every attribute combination, it actually made sense to design a new character class to, avoid the, to explore the new themes. In Pee Wee 2, every attribute combination has two classes associated with it. Strength Int has the Templar or the Druid, on Dexterity, you have the Ranger or the more spear-focused Huntress. And on Dex Int, you have the Shadow and the Monk, which Mark is playing here. Each class has its own three ascendancies that let you further specialize the class in a way that only... Is there going to be a summoner? Two, but they both start at the same location on the passive tree. The quest rewards you are offered on the two variants are tailored to the class. But of course, this is PoE. You can still mix and match anything to your heart's content. Those guys are just the technical miscreations. Gold? What? Gold? Come across the boss for this area. In Pee 2, every area of the campaign contains a boss of at least this difficulty. That's over 100 bosses to fight as you make your way through the campaign, and they all have unique mechanics. More detailed than most uh, random bosses in Axe. I like it. Either this build sucks on purpose so they can show off the boss, or As you've been watching from uh, here, you probably they've the made these guys way too tanky. We've done a lot of things to add mobility to combat. Practically every melee skill in PoE 2 has some kind of movement built into it. But the monk in particular is a melee fighter who specializes in mobility over brute strength. <laughs> Orb of Transmutation. Okay, so they still got the crafting materials. Gold, huh? As Mark has been playing, you might have noticed these blue markers over enemies. Mark has a skill equipped called Killing Palm. Whenever an enemy has a blue indicator over it, it means that the monster has low enough life to cull with Killing Palm. Successfully executing the cull will give you a power charge. This is an important skill for the monk, since many of his... You could hear the crowd go, huh, when the first One gold dropped. The about the skill is that it has a built-in dash forward which makes it much easier to target the skill at, right at the point where you need it. 
We've done a huge amount of work in PoE 2 to make using skills like this feel satisfying. If you're accidentally targeting slightly off the monster, the skill will automatically lock on to the colorable target and it will even do a small amount of pathfinding around obstacles. We really want to make sure that when you've got an opportunity... Skill pathfinding, skill, okay. ...going to get in your way. One of the... Once you have some power charges, you're gonna need some skills to power up. A great follow-up is Falling Thunder. Falling Thunder without a power charge just creates a relatively small lightning AoE in front of you. But if you do it with power charges, it turns into a pack clearer with a large number of extra projectiles. One thing to notice here is that, like almost every melee skill in PoE 2, Falling Thunder has a little bit of extra movement built in just in case you need it. Use the skill within range and you just do the flip in place. You use it at a larger range and your character will move forward while executing it, getting you into position without any time penalty. In PoE 2, you also get a short period to redirect your target. Notice how you can start the skill facing one way, then whip the mouse sideways to land the skill in a different direction? Oh, the muscle memory on that is going to take a while to correct itself. Power charges, you're going to first need to get some lower life monsters into a colorable range. You've got a few options if you want to, if you want to charge right in, Whirling Assault is great. It doesn't do much damage per hit, but it covers a lot of ground. And notice how you can turn as you do it? It looks like poor man's Cyclone. Generally speaking, you never lose control of your character in PoE 2. If you make a turn at the right time... Is Psycho not going to be in PoE 2? They might remove some skills from PoE 2. Uh, and replace them with other stuff that won't be in PoE 1. We've now entered the Vile Mechanarium. This is the place where the Vile built the various constructs that they relied on to power their civilization. Ask Oliver for advice! One useful feature we've added is the ability to call in NPCs to where you are to give you more information or help you with quest objectives, rather than always having to go back to town. In this case, we've called in Alba to find out what to do. This mechanism it's been like 20 years! I guess she is a time uh, time manipulator. There should definitely be cell cores somewhere around here. They had to power these constructs somehow. As Alva just said, we need to find a small soul core to open this door. Let's explore. If you want to shave off some life without getting too close to some of the more dangerous monsters, a great option is Wind Blast. Wind Blast also doesn't do too much damage, but it keeps enemies back. The closer they are, the farther they're pushed back, so it's a great option for keeping smaller but higher damage enemies at bay. Note that the bigger the enemy is, the less they'll be pushed back, so trying to push back some giants isn't going to be as effective. And there's the Soul Core. Let's get back to the door. Taking your sweet time getting back to Alva. Oh, an actual animation for using quest items. Now, if you need to defeat tougher enemies, it might be time to break out some of the ice skills in the monk's arsenal. Glacial Cascade creates a wave of ice that moves slowly in front of the player. Classic. It's ineffective against fast-moving monsters because most of the damage occurs right at the end of the wave. And so a lot of monsters will just walk right by it. But if you can find a way to make a monster stop at just the right place, it can be very effective. In order to do that, you're probably going to want to freeze some monsters. The monk has a few different tools to do this. A fairly, option, a fairly simple option is to get right in the monster's face with Ice Strike. Ice Strike doesn't do too much damage at the first two hits, but attack three times in sequence and you can get off a combo that has a much higher chance to freeze. Get in there with the freeze, then roll back and finish the job with Glacial Cascade. Now, remember how Glacial Cascade is that extra damaging spike at the end? If you hit a frozen enemy with that spike, it shatters the ice on the enemy and does a devastating amount of damage. This is a really great combo against bosses, as you'll see later. Oh yeah, and I've just been casually mentioning rolling around. Did I forget to mention that in PoE 2 we added a dodge roll to every character? Just press spacebar at any time to roll. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so you don't really need There's no cooldown, the dash. No limitations. We heard you like movement skills, so we gave everybody one. When you, <laughs> when you dodge roll, you're not invulnerable. If something hits you, you're going to feel it. But most things aren't going to hit you. And that's because while you're rolling, projectiles and melee strikes will always miss. 
You'll have to roll out of the way of a slam that has AoE, but anyone swinging a sword or throwing a fireball is going to miss. Okay, so it doesn't dodge AoE, but it does dodge... ...out of any skill at any time. This makes it so you don't feel like you're getting stuck during a long animation when something's about to hit you. Oh, you can cancel out of skills with it. ...skills with longer attack and cast times play, and makes dodge roll a very reliable feeling way to avoid attacks. So, that's one way to get out of the way of damage, but the monk specializes in mobility, so it makes sense that it would have some more. Wave of Frost is one of our new attacks with a retreat built right in. You move backwards and throw out a cold attack with a significant freeze. A great thing about this is that it puts you at a good distance to follow up with a glacial cascade and do a whole pile of damage. Yeah, a whole pile of damage. Yeah, sure. You're doing jack all. Ironically, the big guys are going down real fast. Another skill you can use to get some extra freeze is Shattering Palm. Shattering Palm is a palm strike that puts a small ice bomb on the target. Kill or deal enough damage to the target and the bomb will explode, doing some damage and a significant freeze. It's a great option against bosses where the wave of ice might not be enough to get that freeze off. But you really want to get, uh, but you still really want to use Glacial Cascade to get the damage bonus. The final skill we're going to show you today is Flicker Strike. It's a monk skill and another skill that consumes power charges. Is it going to be different from normal Flicker Strike? If you've played Pee Wee 1 before, you know what to expect. Okay, yeah, it's just flicker strike. Okay. They didn't change much. Wait, since when does flicker strike use power charges? I thought it used frenzy charges. I think the biggest gripe anybody would have had with PoE 2 um a being a new client would have been or being a new separate game would have been that you'd have to buy your MTX all over again. So the fact that the MTX carries over um means this is basically all upside. Here we have Black Jaw, former overseer of the Mechanarium. When the Val fell, he was turned to stone and now guards the area. In order to take down this boss, we're going to need all the tools in the Monk's arsenal, especially the combo of, of Freeze and Glacial Cascade. Now, if you're a PoE 1 player, you might think you can't rely on Freeze because there's so many bosses that are immune to it. But in PoE 2, that's changing significantly. Ooh. In PoE 1, Freeze is a binary mechanic. An attack freezes the target, or it doesn't. What this basically means is that in PoE 1, we were forced to add Freeze immunity to many bosses because Freeze just trivialized them. Because of that, freezing okay. is something you could only... Really so I'm guessing freezing is a scale and you accumulate freeze on enemies. In PoE 2, though, all crowd control mechanics now have internal meters that allow you to build up to a freeze or stun, or whatever other CC mechanic that you're using. It's a little bit like poise from games like Elden Ring, though the meters tend to be a lot smaller than those games. When you freeze an enemy... Well, I, I don't know what poise is in Elden Ring. Freeze, ...but the increased difficulty bleeds away slowly. More freeze will always let you freeze the boss more often, but this system means that you will not get out it will not get out of control in party play or interact badly with other CC mechanics, allowing us to let these kinds of mechanics actually work against all bosses. Yeah, you made the character too low damage, so you've run out of things to talk about in the middle of the fight. Okay, so he's got phases. He gets... He, he does new stuff after half, half his health bar is gone. Okay.
Oh, yeah, no, it's perfectly understandable that the characters got crap damage. They're showing off the skills, but I think they corrected too far in the direction of no damage. All right, so this might be a good time to mention that uh, in POE 2, if you die to the boss, you have to start again from the start. There's no boss cheesing. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Oh, there might be a... Is you okay? Oh, one second. One technical issue. <laughs> Programmed in the goss, the boss to die faster. <laughs> All right, we good. Back to the back to the stream. All right. All right. Round two. <laughs> Let's go. You gonna make us watch through the, all that again? I wonder if they'll finish uh, voice acting all the characters through the acts in Path of Exile One. They've done, um, they've done the Templar. I think they did the Duelist, but that leaves five classes where they haven't voice acted stuff from Acts Five through Ten. And I wonder if they'll ever do that now that they've got Path of Exile Two on uh, on their plate. Don't die again. I have to say the game looks fantastic. <laughs> you know, you could use Glacial Cascade more often. I know you've got a playstyle you want to encourage, but people are just going to use Glacial Cascade in this situation. Because the boss is trying to keep you away from it. You almost got it. Huh. That eight point icon, uh, where the level up usually is in Oh in Path of Exile One. Is that the new skill point icon, that diamond? Oh, that, that is a plus inside that diamond. Oh, he had culling strike on. I see. consumable quest item here called the flame core it's a permanent plus 10 to spirit and here we too we really want to make sure that you will feel rewarded for exploration it wouldn't be much good if we made all these awesome optional bosses if we didn't have something great to find for killing them 
Oh! Encouraging people to play the game! Okay. I like it. I like it. Encouraging you to seek out and kill bosses. I cannot fucking wait to play this game. I like that a lot of these are recognizable as reusing animation skeletons and uh, basic character models, but they've updated everything to be different. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's the... Uh, it's the rare with the curse mod. Need to use those, uh, killing palms more often, <laughs> Don't bother with the arch nemesis rare. Just go. Good, okay. Oh, he's getting gang banged. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> My poor heart. Lightning strike. Oh. I think you got completely lost there. <laughs> I have no idea where I am. <laughs> Gee, it would be nice if you had a mini map. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right, here we are. Here we are. Here's the X. area we're going to call in a sorceress i'd like to welcome octavian to the stage who's going to join the party with mark oh octavian it's somebody who's uh better at the game than the devs all right here we here we go all right the sorceress is the new intelligence focused character in poe2 while the witch focuses more on occult magic and summoning, the sorceress is themed around pure elemental destruction. But I want a summoner. I want a summoner. I want to play Path of Exile 2 as a summoner. This is the largest soul core I've ever seen. With this, we could power the canal systems. But it isn't charged. There is still latent energy in this machinarium from its ancient operation. These lines in the stonework should lead to generators. You might need to find some more soul cores to spin them up, but everything looks to be in surprisingly decent condition. <coughs> Maybe the golems have been maintaining it. In any case, it should still function. We'll have to remove that large core from the wall, of course, but that shouldn't be a problem. It's going to turn into a boss when you try. You're probably going to recognize if you've played Pee-Wee one before, but they feel a bit different now. Spark is great in these tight passages since it bounces around. We've added a pierce support gem to really allow it to hit an entire room full of targets. Spark has always been fun. Oh man, I remember when Vol Spark could be tw could be uh, tweaked to fire two thousand sparks. It hits all enemies around you and slows them down with a chill. Because at first, um, when, when Spark, when Volspark was first added, it fired Spark 
like 50 times individual casts um uh and so fork and extra projectiles and stuff would um fork and extra projectiles would clone each uh each spark projectile you have to be standing still for a little while to get the full effect so trying to stutter step using it isn't the best strategy now arctic armor is an ongoing buff but did you notice it didn't reserve any mana how does that work well, Ooh. we were pretty sick of the fact that in Peewee 1, basically every character was playing with no mana pool. So we decided to change the way that reservation works. Okay. In Peewee 2, there's a new resource called Spirit. Spirit is a dedicated resource that you can use for ongoing effects. Like oh, that's what the Spirit armor, stat is. And minions. <laughs> Wait. Minions cost Spirit? Everyone's oh, that's a nerf to, uh... Two summoners. You're going to need to get some more spirit, which is available on mods from items and on the passive tree. But if you're willing to go up your offhand slot, the easiest way to get it is by holding a scepter. Find out more about that in the items talk later on. Now, if you want to increase the cold damage that you're dealing, you can always use Frost Bomb. It places a bomb on the ground that reduces enemies' cold resistance while it's ticking down. It's a great opportunity to use some cold skills before it explodes. And speaking of cold skills, a great skill to use on monsters with lower cold resistance is Comet. Comet? Ooh. It's a new skill in PoE 2 and it hits pretty damn hard. It costs a lot of mana and has a really long cast time, but it's worth the wait. It does a devastating... It kind of looks like Armageddon Brand, to be honest. out of danger, your character moves back slightly as it casts. It's pretty hard to hit fast-moving opponents, but it's great on tougher enemies that stand still, or even a larger pack if you're further away and can predict where they're going to move. Now, if you run out of mana casting too many of those, I guess in an emergency you could use your free to cast fireball. So where did that come from, you ask? Well, this is a great opportunity to explain the way that we've changed caster weapons in PoE 2. Oh. Now, in PoE 1, caster weapons had a default melee attack that nobody used. And because they had that, they also had a bunch of attack mods that would spawn on them that were useless to a caster. In PoE 2, we wanted to clean that up. So each staff now comes with a built-in free to cast spell. Oh, but you can't attack. Okay. <laughs> Just put it on and spam away to your heart's content. Now this particular staff is the base type that you'll get right on the starting beach. So it's quite likely that you'll have outgrown it by now. So that's why we've also um, made a lot of staves with more utility-focused powers for casters to use. Here we have a crystal staff. It has a pretty cool built-in spell called Unleash. Using it slams your staff on the ground and will allow you to triple cast whatever you cast with your next spell. Now, of course, what you're probably going to want to use with that is something powerful. And Comet is a great option. Cool. I can see myself playing Path of Exile 2 for a few leagues at least. In general, we really try to avoid using cooldowns because we really hate the feeling that combat is just waiting to cast your next spell. But it does make sense I agree. I hate cooldowns too. We want you to use situationally anyway. Now, if you're facing something tough, you might need to try out Mana Tempest. Mana Tempest creates a circle of power which your character literally hovers over the ground. While in the circle, your mana drains, but it powers up all your spells. Lightning projectiles will fork, beams will chain further, and you also do a lot more damage. Okay. Cool. Oh god, it's Ley Lines from Final Fantasy XIV. Okay, the refill so, ghosting for using time. potions First, on your mana pool is a little too. Cold resistance. Then use mana tempest to increase your damage. Follow up with unleash and then triple cast comet to do a truly insane amount Faint. of Ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whose fault is that? <laughs> this rare monster has dropped an uncut gem, and that's a great opportunity to talk about how skill gems drop in PoE 2. Ooh. Instead of dropping specific gems, you can find uncut gems. Just right-click on them and pick whatever skill you want. What? 
Oh, but you're limited to the class you have and what you've unlocked. The gym will come pre-level to the level of the area that dropped it. So it's a lot easier to change between skills in PoE 2. This time I think it might be cool to grab one of our meta gems. Meta gems are skills that can have other skills socketed into them, changing how they work. In this case, we're going to select Cast On Shock. Now, let's equip this thing in the skill screen and choose which spell to trigger with it. I think Comet might be fun. Now, because Cast On Shock reserves Spirit, we'll need to first disable our Arctic Armor. We have to decide if we'd rather have the extra defense or the extra offense of the Cast On Shock using our Spark. In PoE 2, Trigger Gems use a system of filling up cast time on each trigger. Basically, if a skill has a short cast time, it will trigger really often. And if it has a long cast time, like this Comet here, it will take a lot longer to trigger. You can see on the top left corner, that there's a counter that shows you how long until the next trigger. Hopefully you shot some monsters. <laughs> Go. Alright, that takes a while. That takes a while. This was a this was a bad skill to demonstrate that with. So we found the generator. Time to power it up. Okay, that's pretty cool. Constructs are coming back to life. We want to fight, fight them on the way back to the charged soul core. So, one thing that PoE 1 players might have noticed is this character has both lightning spells and cold spells. Which is suboptimal in 1. It's a big no no for most builds because any specialization into cold or lightning isn't going to affect the other element. And generic elemental damage increases are not going to be as powerful as focusing on a single element. Well, in PoE 2, we have another major new system to introduce to solve these kinds of problems. And it starts, oddly enough, with weapon swap. Now, in PoE 1, Weapon Swap isn't really used much for its originally intended purpose. We imagine that people are going to be swapping in and out between different weapons to deal with whatever situation they were in. People just don't do that at all. And a large reason for that is because it's really, really awkward. In PoE 2, we wanted to uh, solve all of that. The staff Octavian is using here has an ice mod on it that makes it great for when he's using his ice spells. But we would also like to be able to make sure that this build works just as well for his lightning spells. If Octavian equips his previous staff in his second weapon set, you can see that it appears on the character's back. Oh, you get buffs screen. from both? If Octavian opens the skill options for his lightning skills. You can see here that you can choose which weapon sets are usable with each skill. First, we uncheck set one from being used by his lightning skills. Then we go through the cold skills and turn those off with his lightning weapon. Just take a second. <laughs> if I can remember where they all are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, when we use spark, the character will automatically switch to the lightning staff on his back and then use the skill. Oh. And when Octavian uses his Ice Nova, his character automatically switches to his Ice Staff before using it. That's cool. That's cool. How's it going to interact with the with tree efficiency, though? You can configure each skill for which set to use, or both if you don't mind which. There's a very short time penalty to switching, so it can be good to leave some skills on both sets if it doesn't matter which weapon set you're using. But we still have a problem. Passives. Wouldn't it be nice yes. if we could specialize in both cold and lightning passives on the character? Well, in PoE 2, you Do you swap trees, too? Hopefully Mark can deal with those monsters while uh, we do this demo. <laughs> do you have swappable trees? So, we're on the passive skill screen here, and you can see that we are close to both a cold and a lightning cluster. You have swappable right trees! You can see that we have some weapon set specific points to allocate. If Octavian holds shift, he can allocate set 1 to the cold passives, and then allocate set 2 to the lightning passives. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Check it out. I'm sold. As we use our weapon swap, the skills allocate changes from one build to the other automatically. Oh shit! We cast the appropriate spell, the You're gonna need regret orbs out the ass. To the correct build for that spell. You're gonna need regret orbs like crazy whenever you swap weapon weapons. Or swap in a new weapon. So you're not going to be changing from a mace slamming warrior into a fire elementalist with a press of a button. But it certainly increases the number of options you have for builds. There's a huge number of places where the system can shine. You can augment your dagger shadow build with traps, or have a great curse set up on your witch with one spec, and then move to your chaos debuff spells with the other, for example. It really opens up your options. 
Now, another fun metagem to try out is called Barrier Invocation. This works a little bit like the trigger gems I talked about before, but this one charges up as your energy shield is hit by monsters. We're gonna put an Ice Nova in this one. The more energy shield you lose, the more charge builds up. Let's get that one equipped there, yep. Uh, so yeah, the more energy shield you lose, the more charge will build up until the point you're able to cast the socketed skill instantly. There we go. So you lose some, uh, yeah, so you lose some energy shield and at just the right time, invoke Ice Nova to cast all the stacked up copies in one instant cast. If you keep losing shield, you'll build up even more charge. No wonder they're letting you have so many more six links. No wonder, because, um, you'll be doing so many more things at once now. They've really set it up to encourage you to use more than one button. Just the fact that you can swap between, like, shock and freeze, and they'll both work on bosses. <laughs> Overkill. Um, and here we are back at the charge soul core. Is awesome. Is, uh, take it. I'm optimistic. <laughs> Just take it. <laughs> Bye, Alpha. <laughs> So what class is going to fit summons now? Because Druid isn't a Necromancer. God, they took Path of Exile and made it more complicated! Oh, this is not going to be good for onboarding people. Um, it's a cool system, but... Oh, they took the complicated ARPG and made it more complicated. I like it. But this is going to be even more daunting for new players. Oh my god. Okay, this boss is cool. So that's Path of Exile 2. These areas, as well as around half of each of the first four acts, are available to play at three demo zones around ExileCon. Now, if you're physically here at this event and you get to play the demo, just remember, it's a different game than before. It's a lot harder. You're probably gonna run the first pack of monsters and just die. <laughs> I really recommend you read the signs. They have good advice on how to combine your skills effectively, and remember, dodge rolls on spacebar, use it. <laughs> you're just gonna die otherwise. So your next question is likely to be, when is the beta? Well, yes. our last year of development, but we're, and we're still finishing acts, adding skills and balancing everything. The closed beta is gonna start on June 7th, 2024. Oh. Path of Exile 2 has been a long time coming and we're incredibly excited to be near the finish line. Oh. We're not quite there yet. We're determined not a to year. and make sure we get everything right. Oh. There's a lot in store for POE1. I'll hand back over- Well, to something to look forward to, I guess. Well, I'm sold. 
but they took the complicated ARPG and made it more complicated. How'd they even do that? So, that demo is very hard for them to do in person. Like, I am very impressed it went that well. So, as Jonathan explained, Path of Exile 1 will continue to be its own unique game once Path of Exile... Oh, is Final Fantasy XIV um, releasing 7.0 next June? ...some microtransactions are shared between the two games, and their expansion releases are offset from each other, it's super easy... Is, did they announce that today at FanFest? So, I'm going off script for a second here, and just going to explain this a bit better. Imagine we release a Path of Exile 2 expansion, right? So everyone dives in and plays it. You give it, say, out of the 13-week cycle, you're going to play for, you know, some hardcore players play for the first few weeks, some people play for most of the time. We're going to aim a Path of Exile 1 expansion to come out towards the end of that cycle, say four or five weeks from the end, which also lasts for three months. So oh. because Path of Exile 2 has more content and is a significantly larger game, it will mean that you can play Path of Exile 2 for the majority of the cycle, and then either keep playing if you want to keep playing Path of Exile 2, or jump into Path of Exile 1 when its league launches and enjoy that. Either okay. Either period or until the next Path of Exile 2 one comes out. Cool. And of course, because your purchases are shared, if you were to buy supporter packs or microtransactions in either, they're just available on your characters in the other. Speaking of Path of Exile 1 expansions, we've got one coming out in just three weeks, on August 18th. Oh, yeah, details. Let's watch the trailer for yeah. Path of Exile, Trial of the Ancestors. Trial of the Ancestors? Souls such as yours do not go quietly into the... Navoli! They thirst for battle. They yearn to prove themselves. All right, Karui-themed uh, expansion. To the whole... Navali. Oh, this is already awesome. Is that a turtle? Is that a sea turtle? Oh, you get to make armies to fight? Passive skill tattoos? What's that mean? Sixteen new Atlas keystones. Itemize set. Oh, Sanctum's back! Guardian revamp. Huh. All new chieftain. Ooh. So much for my chieftain cyclone in standard. August 18th. Ooh, what's my schedule look like in August? Uh, oh man, I'm gonna be on my trip on the 18th. In the Karui Afterlife, the fallen chieftains of each tribe participate in a tournament called the Trial of the Ancestors. You will journey to the afterlife, assemble your own team, and enter the tournament to battle those chieftains and earn valuable rewards. As you play through areas in the Ancestor Challenge League, you'll find tradable silver coins. Using them will take Silver you Coins to are back! Afterlife, where you will encounter Navali, who you may remember from the Prophecy League. Each coin You took away all my silver coins! You start the tournament with a basic team consisting of three warriors. The tournament is double elimination, meaning you're allowed to have one loss without consequence. A second loss eliminates you from the tournament. Your team will compete against ten other tribes, and you choose who you're going to challenge Cow. out of the teams left in the tournament. When you start a match, you see the configuration of the enemy team and get to place your team of warriors on the battlefield to challenge theirs. You and your party of exiles will play alongside your warriors. So while this league does have many elements of an auto-battler, you're right there fighting alongside them. During a match, when a warrior dies, they respawn at their totem after a short time. If their totem is destroyed, then they are instantly killed and can't respawn. The team that destroys all of the opposing totems wins. 
If you're playing a hardcore character, though, don't worry. Hinakora, the goddess of death, is watching over you and will restore your soul to your body, so you can't permanently die in the afterlife. Like that. In the trial of the ancestors, strategy and tactics are key. Every unit has its own strength. Oh, people are just going to overwhelm it with pack clear. The turtle is really slow and really tanky. It's perfect for either defensive positioning to stop flankers or offensive positioning to tank hits for you if you're pushing through the middle. It's not great in the center or flank positions due to its slow movement speed. The Tuatara is a quick and deceptive unit, which is relatively well balanced for all positions. This version of the Tuatara has a stealth ability, which makes it perfect for the flanking position to sneak through enemy defenses and take out unprotected totems from the side. The Goliath of Might is a disruptor unit, and it's ideally placed in a center position to intercept enemies that are chasing you. You can also allocate it to defenses so that it disrupts enemies that are trying to kill your totems by stunning them. So in this match here, we've set up a Tuatara in a flanking position, a turtle on defense to guard our totems, and a Goliath to follow us as we attack up the middle. Our plan is to work with the Goliath to distract the enemy front line so the flanking Tuatara can get through and destroy some of their totems. This is going to be a mess. I hope it's balanced well. Upon winning a match, you earn favor and other rewards. I'll talk about the other rewards shortly. There are a lot. You have a separate amount of favor with each tribe, and you can spend it by talking to their chieftain to recruit warriors and purchase field items and equipment that your team can use. Each tribe has specific specialities. For example, Hinakora's tribe manipulates life and death. Rongo Kurai's tribe is slow and tanky, with an emphasis on stuns and knockbacks. You can recruit warriors from many different tribes and mix and match them together into your team based on what you need. Cool. Field items are items that are placed on the battlefield and can be activated during the match to, for example, revive a warrior or heal your entire team. If a field item isn't consumed within a match, it persists on to the next match. But your warriors, their equipment, and your field items are all wiped between tournaments. You enter each tournament fresh. Huh. Your success okay. in the tournament updates your overall ranking, which helps you in better rewards and subsequent ones. Speaking of rewards, let's discuss the good part. What you can earn for succeeding at the trial of the ends. You can tell this gets me excited. <laughs> You get a reward as you win each round of the tournament, and these rewards are visible when you're selecting which tribe you want to play against. Oh, transforms travel nodes. And some, are, oh, the, yeah. and some of them are exclusive new rewards. You so can you can turn a travel node into 2% increased movement speed. My words to get to the part where I can explain tattoos. <laughs> okay. The ancestors reward you with special tattoos that are not applied to your skin, but they're engraved on your soul. This process can transform what your attribute skills on the passive tree do, basically the attribute highway nodes generally. The regular ones can only be applied to basic attribute skills and allow you to convert your tree's attribute oh, but there's highways into something more useful for More you. robust for ones example, that hit the plus 30 nodes. small dexterity skill into movement speed. Each tribe has its own exclusive passive tattoos. This tattoo converts a small strength skill into additional fire resistance. This one converts a small intelligence skill flat damage for it in passives converts a small strength skill into one that summons a minion when you take a savage hit from a unique enemy but don't go overboard on the number of skills you convert with tattoos as you'll probably need at least some of your attributes left to equip items each of the 10 tribes has an exclusive unique item that you can earn oh oh plus 9 10 to max life if there are no life modifiers and other equipped items holy crap as you can see, it grants an immense amount of life for a single item, providing you don't have any life on any other pieces of your equipment. Oh, that's... It also frees up all those other potential... That's Calm's heart all over again. ...benefits your build, making it pure upside. This amulet is a unique item you can earn by defeating the Arohongui tribe. It has the powerful effect of causing your flasks to instantly recover life and mana whenever you're low. This could potentially be a powerful panic button, or maybe you want to build around permanently being on low life or mana, so all of your flask usage is instant. If you manage to win the entire tournament, you'll not only receive the reward for the final match, but Hinokura will also give you a choice of three additional... 
next. Sorry, button didn't work. Of three additional exclusive items. Let's have a look at some of the things you may be offered. First up, there are four unique items that exclusively come from Hinakora for completing the tournament. This belt, for example, lists a plethora of really powerful properties, both beneficial and detrimental. While you're wearing the belt, the property shifts around every five seconds. You never know what's gonna happen next. Will you always crit, always evade, never evade? Maybe you're able to find some ways to build around the detrimental effects to create as much upside as possible. No, I think that's gonna be a vendor trash unique. Nicora also has a selection of special, more advanced passive tree tattoos that you can only receive from her. This one transforms a 30 intelligence notable attribute skill into one that increases the level of all of your intelligence gems. You're only that's robust. To the specific attribute combination tattoo on a tree. Hinakora can also award you with a new type of item called an omen. These are small items that sit in your inventory until a condition is met, at which point they are consumed and something happens. In Interesting. This case, if you reach 25% life, your flasks are all replenished. Now, don't worry, each player can only consume one omen per combat area, so you don't have any reason to fill your entire inventory with them. This one People are going to anyway. <laughs> you made it for me. <laughs> it won't try to save your life, but it will save you some time. This one grants you Soul Eater when you level up. That's too narrow. For that occasional massive power boost. Omens are tradable but hard to get, so use them carefully. I shudder to think about how much this one is going to be worth in the presence of those incredibly oh, unique weapons. Oh, fortune favors. Going oh, Omen. Oh, Back in the day, when we had stuff like the Prophecy and so on that let you upgrade to rare forcibly on a specific base type, we had to block the good items by putting crap, rare, crap uniques on the, um, sorry, I meant upgrade to unique. Um, we put crap uniques on that base type so that you couldn't get it every time. Well, we stopped doing that. So a lot of the uniques that were upgraded in 320 um, are just the only thing on the base type. So items like this let you deterministically get something quite valuable, hence they are quite rare. The most exciting one, though. Finally, Hinakura can offer you a lock of her hair. This is a very special currency item that lets you foresee the result of using another currency item to craft something. This means, for example, you can know whether it's worth exalting your item because you'll know exactly what the outcome is. Hinakura's lock will slot into your crafting pipeline with powerful consequences. The Trial of the Ancestors offers a wide... That, I don't know how I feel about that. Complete matches and tournaments. We really look forward to seeing what strategies you develop for building, equipping, carefully placing and playing alongside your tribe. So that's the new Challenge League, but Path of Exile expansions contain more than just a new league every three months. In each update, we also augment Path of Exile's endgame and shift the metagame with new gems and balance changes. This expansion is no exception. I'm going to explain the other changes in a medium amount of detail. I'm conscious that we have both new and existing players. For new players, I'm going to try to include some extra content to help make the changes more understandable. You can find out all the detail in the patch notes and other information we'll be posting in the few weeks before release. Okay. Let's start with how the Trial of the Ancestors expansion expands Path of Exile's endgame. In December last year, we released an expansion called the Forbidden Sanctum, which introduced the Sanctum Challenge League. This league was a roguelike game set within Path of Exile where you would randomly explore a randomly generated sanctum one room at a time alongside your regular play. You'd pick which rooms you wanted to explore out of several options and accumulate beneficial boons and detrimental afflictions that made your run easier and harder, respectively. Not only did Sanctum work really well as a league, but it also had the potential to be added to Path of Exile as part of its core endgame content alongside systems like Mapping, Delve, and Heist. Well, in this expansion, the Forbidden Sanctum is back. Excellent. I'll finally get to play it. I should have played it when it was a league. I've really been looking forward to this one. We're reintroducing the Sanctum as core content in Path of Exile's endgame. You'll initially meet Divinia, the Sanctum NPC, in Act 10. Sanctum Do we get to invite her to our hideout? While playing maps in the end game. A forbidden tome represents a whole floor of the we do get to invite her to our hideout. To back, or you can take breaks between them and do something else if you choose. Upon successfully completing that Sanctum floor, the next floor is generated as a tradable item with all of the state of your Sanctum run built in. Ooh. This means that the item stores what boons and afflictions you had, what rewards you've locked in, and how much resolve you have left. You can then either play this floor or trade it to someone else if it feels more beneficial. That's cool! For example, let's say you manage to lock in a really valuable reward. The example here is a Mirror of Calandra, but you'll also notice that... Do I have a laser pointer? 
It doesn't work on the board. Okay, one resolve. Um, This is an example here where the player has a very good reward locked in, but a massive pile of dangerous afflictions and only one resolve on them. If you don't feel capable of completing the rest of the sanctum from this point, then it would normally be a write-off, right? If you gave this to me, no way am I getting that mirror. But you can now trade the sanctum state to someone else who is willing to pay for the chance to earn the mirror or lose it. And, it, you know, you, you can look at expected value in economics, right? It's worth some percentage of that mirror. So you trade it for like five chaos to someone, they run it and lose their chaos. <laughs> Your relics, which act as passive bonuses within the sanctum, are locked in for the run when you start the first floor and can't be changed for the rest of the run. Speaking of relics, they're now tradable and have been rebalanced around this. Cool. To those of you wondering, we have decided against bringing back sanctified relics for now. A complete Sanctum run now requires killing the final boss, Lycia, in both her first and second form. She will always drop a unique relic, and these have been reworked and replaced as we've rebalanced everything. An important aspect of the new Sanctum balance is that your primary defenses now have some effect on protecting your resolve. Ooh. Your armor allows you to mitigate resolve loss, and your evasion grants you a chance to avoid resolve loss entirely, a lot like how armor and evasion work. Your energy shield grants you Resolve Aegis, which is a mechanic that works similarly to how energy shield behaves for life. In light of the new defensive opportunities and learnings from the original Challenge League, we've rebalanced the difficulty of Sanctum, especially in later floors, and have worked to add more monster and room variety to runs. This is cool! We've added new boons and afflictions themed around the new defensive mechanics and have rebalanced many of the other ones. Like other optional endgame systems that involve tradable items, players who don't want to play Sanctum can trade their Sanctums to other players in exchange for an item or currency that benefits them more. Successful Sanctum play can generate a lot of rewards. It'll potentially be possible to build characters dedicated to Sanctum running and just farm Sanctums repeatedly in order to profit. Sanctum isn't the only improvement that Trial of the Ancestors ooh, brings ooh. to Path of Excel's Tell me! We're also new Atlas Keystones! New Atlas Passive... At Atlas Keystone Passives to the Atlas Passive Tree. As a quick summary for new players joining us, the Atlas Tree is a system that allows you to customize your endgame experience in Path of Exile. As you, complete difficult, as you complete different maps, you gain skill points that can be allocated in the tree. You could use these points to modify the behavior of different content you encounter in endgame maps to make it more difficult or more rewarding or to behave entirely differently. The system allows you to double down on the content you enjoy and avoid content you don't. Keystones are really impactful passives that totally change your endgame system's behavior. Scarab's great pass usually pack size. <laughs> usually they have an element of give and take and require you to come up with new strategies to take advantage of them. Each of these 16 new Atlas Keystones changes how you might interact with Path of Exile's endgame. Let's have a look at some of them now. We will reveal the rest of them in, before the release of Trial of the Ancestors in a few weeks. Extreme Archaeology completely changes how you play Expedition Encounters. Instead oh, they're doing specific ones series for series different League content. You now place one gigantic explosive. <laughs> every single chest or monster in the blast radius is affected by every remnant in that radius. Oh, cool! Oh, they all come out at once, of course. The of the dead makes it so that tormented spirits can possess you rather than possessing monsters. Ooh! <laughs> Boosting your stats instead. While possessed, you can touch monsters just like a spirit can, making them stronger and more rewarding. It's, it's kind of getting silly at this point, isn't it? <laughs> I like that. Blight is like a tower defense minigame inside Path of Exile. The Cassia's Pride Keystone makes it so that Blight Monsters take significantly less damage from players and significantly more damage from Blight Towers. This well, I like Scout Towers anyway. Like an actual tower defense game. Because we can. <laughs> Lucid Dreams makes it so that Vol side areas in your maps are no... Craftable Vol side areas? You use currency items to change their mods. That's right. When you encounter a Vol side, side area, the Keystone lets you craft it. Tell me there are unique ones now. Yeah, so we rebalanced the side area mods, we've improved reward outcomes, and we've made the downside mods a bit more punishing, you know, just to make it interesting if you try to go for the good outcomes. You may also rarely encounter a unique yes! side area. 
destructive play makes it so that the Maven will summon between one and three extra random map bosses when you are fighting witnessed map bosses. Oh. This keystone is analogous to the Eldritch Altar keystones that make those influences more difficult but more rewarding. There are another 11 new keystones that we'll reveal over the next few weeks. Together, these 16 keystones mean that regardless of how you enjoy your maps, you'll have plenty of new ways to play Path of Exile's endgame in this expansion. That's and cool. Note, in the initial draft of the keynote, I painstakingly went through every single keystone. It took like 10 minutes. But we'll put them in the news to save you some time here. In the Trial of the Ancestors expansion, we're shifting Path of Exile's metagame in several ways. The first is by introducing 14 new support gems. 14? Which are designed to take existing categories of skills and provide entirely new ways to play them. For full information, check the final gem hovers when we post them in the next few weeks. Let's have a look at a handful of these support gems now. In Path of Exile, war cries usually buff your party but don't directly hurt monsters. The Corrupting Cry support gem turns war cries into damage dealing skills by making them inflict corrupted blood on monsters affected by the war cry or by your attacks that it exerts. Oh, cool. The Returning Projectiles support gem causes projectiles from supported skills to return to you, piercing all targets but dealing a little less damage. I love it. I think there's another example too. The Fresh Meat Support Gem causes minions created by supported gems to gain adrenaline, critical strike chance, and critical strike damage for a duration after they're first summoned. So you've got to work out a way to keep refreshing your minions, and it makes them a lot more powerful. The Flamewood Support Gem causes totems to trigger projectile mortars at enemies that hit them. This is particularly synergistic with totems that can taunt enemies, such as Decoy Totem, or one of the new Chieftain Ascendancy skills that I might talk about shortly. Ooh, okay. The Sacrifice Support Gem works on spells that you either cast yourself or through totems. These spells now sacrifice a percentage of your current life or the totem's life to gain additional chaos damage based on how much life was sacrificed. Okay, so Dark Knight from Final Fantasy. The Bond Support Gem affects Link skills and causes oh, a cold mist to come over them. Enemies caught in the beam are chilled and are dealt cold damage over time. This creates a new tool for a cold damage of a time build requiring strategic close line them of both yourself and your Link's ally. Okay, that might make Link skills actually fun. The Locust Mind support gem looks OP and affects attack skills that use bows and wands. Instead of directly using the supported skill, you throw mines in an arc that use that skill for you, targeting your location when you detonate them. In addition to these gems, there are another seven that we'll be revealing over the next few weeks. Cool. In addition to the 14 new support gems, our balance work for the Trial of the Ancestors involved us revamping two Ascendancy classes. These are the subclasses that you can specialize in as you play through Path of Exile's campaign. Each main character class has three Ascendancy classes available. In the last expansion, Crucible, we overhauled the Pathfinder and Saboteur. This time, it's the Guardian and Chieftain, which are specializations of the Templar and Marauders, respectively. While we were very happy with the theme of the Guardian, it was falling behind the power level and popularity of other Ascendancy classes. Our changes in this expansion have modernized the class and will present you with more relevant build opportunities. Didn't they just revamp Guardian level. like two years okay. ago? Path of Exile 102. Harmony of Purpose can power up parties using Link skills. Time of Need now completely cleanses and heals you every four seconds. Radiant and Unwavering Crusade both fully embrace the Holy Summoner theme by giving you access to some exciting new types of minions that are exclusive to this Ascendancy class. We have this picture on the announcement page, pathofexor.com slash ancestor for you to scrutinize. Next. <laughs> While the Guardian's revamp was similar to that of the Pathfinder, the Chieftain has received the Saboteur treatment. To be honest, we were unhappy about many aspects of the Ascendancy class in its old form, and so we have completely redesigned it. You, you can play it now. It's basically an entirely new Ascendancy class with the same name and art and a new way of approaching its themes. Its new skills let you, among other things, cause enemies to explode, turn off enemies' fire resistance while you're stationary, convert passive skills to apply to fire damage, and have your fire resistances apply to your cold and lightning resistances. I'll just give you a sec more to read. <laughs> Alright, that's on the site too for you to check. Enemies you now. kill explode. Damn! 
To celebrate the release of The Trial of the Ancestors, we'll be hosting a boss kill event. To enter, create a hardcore solo cell phone character in the Ancestor League and race to kill all... Not ruthless the this time. Good. The same they learned their lesson. Unlike the last event we ran, this one is not a ruthless event. We'll post more information about the event and its prizes in the news before release. Best of luck to everyone. For the Ancestor Challenge League, we're launching two new series of supporter packs, the Shade and Disciple packs. Each tier contains the pack's full face value Show me. points alongside several exclusive I am curious. These packs are only available for the duration of the Ancestor League and will leave the store forever when it ends. As always, the microtransactions in these packs are purely cosmetic and do not affect the character's power or progression in any way despite how cool they look. The Shade series of supporter packs contains six exclusive microtransactions. All right, the sarcophagus back attachment imprisons an unspeakable evil that struggles to break free. Nearby monsters send it into a frenzy, and enemy deaths provide it with souls to feast upon. Okay, that's the neat. Waypoint shackles visitors to your hideout in chains, yourself included. These chains are just cosmetic, though, and they break as soon as you move. It would supposedly be a gameplay advantage to be able to imprison people. <laughs> The ferryman's armor set is so full of trapped souls that some of them try to escape. Moving while wearing the boots will leave souls in your wake trying to break free. The infernal portal opens a gate to the nether realm when you approach. This prompted a lot of internal discussion about whether using hellfire to heat your hideout is actually safe and practical. The demon-bound crafting bench allows you to enslave a malevolent entity to craft items for you. Be warned, it has a sharp tongue and will mock you mercilessly. You chained me for such a paltry use. Okay, that's the pretty cool. Character effect causes items you pick up to orbit you in an ethereal cloud of loot. That's cool. That's cool. The Disciple series of supporter packs also contain six exclusive microtransactions. Look at Dog. <laughs> I'm going to put that in the top pack. The Hero's Landing finisher effect summons a marble statue from the heavens to execute unique monsters you defeat. You decide whether it's the sword or the huge lump of rock that actually kills them. The Bell Tower map device heralds the opening of a new map with a peal of bells. Start to run out of portals, though, and it will reflect your desperate situation. That's cool. This is fine. <laughs> That's cool. The cathedral armor set reflects light, refracts light through your character, creating beautiful patterns on the ground around it. If your life gets low, it responds in kind. The Observer Diamond Flask summons a tentacled mass that fires its eye lasers at enemies you critically strike while the flask is active. Again, cosmetic. The Currency Orb Charge Effect lets you pick from a number of different currency types to replace your charges with, as long as you've used that currency item any time from today onwards. Some oh, so you have to use a mirror! Store it in the database, right? Some people will, be, will show they can be part of the exclusive club of players who have actually used a mirror of Calandra. This effect also causes your charges to display in Oh, that's disgusting! So use your standard mirror. That's disgusting! Which we all have, right? <laughs> the faithful hound pet is a very good doggo, and it knows a few tricks. You can command it to sit, roll over, or play dead. And yes... You can pet the dog. Yeah! <laughs> Aww. These new packs are available right now at pathofxl.com slash purchase, and purchases like these directly fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile 1 and 2. Meanwhile, the Lithomancer and Enchanter packs leave the store forever at the launch of Trial of the Ancestors, so now's your last chance to purchase them. There's some good stuff in those too. Thanks for your continued support. The fun part. For the last ExileCon, we developed a special card game that encapsulated the full gameplay arc of Path of Exile over the course of the event. Players could defeat monsters, progressively upgrade their items, use currency items to craft their equipment, find and run maps, and eventually defeat pinnacle bosses to earn rewards. It was a whole lot of fun, and we've, we've had so many requests to run it again. So this year, we're proud to bring you the 2023 version of the ExileCon card game. And like all Path of Exile expansions, it even includes a challenge league. <laughs> 
In your swag bags, you'll have found a box of Exocon cards, and then a gentleman outside will have asked to purchase them from you for real money. <laughs> if you have any cards left, <laughs> you can use these to challenge GGG staff members who are walking around Exocon as monsters. They'll be wearing t-shirts showing the monster's stats, which include symbols for their attack and defense. Using the cards in your deck box and those you accumulate by defeating monsters, put together one set of armor, one weapon and shield, or a two-handed weapon, and an amulet and two rings. To defeat a monster, the damage on your weapon has to be equal to or larger than the defense of the monster, and the defense on the armor and shield have to be equal to or larger than the attack of the monster. It's that simple. There are some wild card symbols. It's explained on the rules in the box. Rings and amulets are pretty hard to find, and they can be used for either attack or defense. So to attack a monster, politely approach a staff member wearing the shirt, introduce yourself, and show them the set of equipment you want to use. If your symbols match, then you'll have defeated them, and they'll give you a reward and remove some of, your, of the durability from your items. They do this by clicking the card, so if you want to give the card pristine, don't necessarily attack someone with it. It will get damaged in combat. Um, be careful not to waste your best items on low-level monsters. You're not allowed to attack the same monster twice in a row, so you need to explore Exocon to find different GGG staff members. You can get maps by defeating monsters marked as gods. Take these maps to the map device to run them and progress through the tiers. On the back of the box is a list of quests. As you complete quests, you can visit... God, now I really want to find a mirror, just so I can... Just so I can style on people with my mirror charges. I mentioned that this year's version of the card game introduced a challenge league. That league is Delve. Accumulate sulfite and bring it to the Delve wall. Sorry for the bad photo, it's hard with lighting. <laughs> on the middle floor. Each sulfite card you hand in allows you to explore one tile of the Azerite mine. You'll all be working collaboratively throughout the event to delve deep into the mine, fight the monsters that lurk there, and uncover its treasures. And it's cool. really bad for the poor people that had to hang 3,000 cards on that wall. <laughs> You may eventually be able to challenge the pinnacle bosses if you manage to get really far in the card game. I'm the Searing Exarch, Jonathan is the Eater of Worlds, and Mark is the Maven. Defeating any of the three of us will reward you with a Mirror of Calandra enamel pin. This pin is exclusively available for winning the card game and won't be sold in the merchandise shop. Each person can only receive a maximum of two mirrors, and when they run out, we can't give any more out, so try to win the game early. The reason for two is a very typical part of Exile reason, one for you and one to trade. <laughs> All right, it's almost time to go and experience Exocon 2023. Aside from the card game, we've prepared a full weekend of activities for you. There's a busy roster of talks and interviews on the main stage and the streamer stage. We've posted a schedule at pathofexile.com slash exocon, so you can see what is happening when and where. The schedule also includes information on meet and greet sessions. Our special guests this year include a roster of many of your favorite streamers, but also some game development industry friends we've met over the last 16 years. We're proud to once again welcome the creators of the Diablo series, David Brevik, Max Schaefer, and Eric Schaefer, as well as Travis Baldry, who you may know from Fate, Torchlight, and his popular fantasy books, or even the books he's narrated. They'll not only have meet and greet sessions, but are also participating in an action RPG roundtable discussion alongside me and Eric tomorrow on the stage. In all of the developer talks and panels, Exocon attendees will be able to scan a QR code on their phone to submit questions for the speakers to discuss on the panel or on the Q&A section of the talk. The Path of Exile 2 Exocon demo is a large one, and you may want to play it multiple times this weekend. In each session, you can pick from one of four character classes, which start at various points throughout the first four acts of Path of Exile 2's campaign. Around half of each act is included in the demo, and your session time is limited to 45 minutes before you have to let someone else have a turn. Remember, as Jonathan said earlier, this demo is hard. Read the signs that explain how your skills combine together. Dodge roll is your new friend. You should also swing by the path of exile. I'm jealous of these people. I wish I were rich enough to go to exile con. It's coming along really well, and we'd love to get your feedback on it. We've created heaps of new path of exile merchandise, which is available at our merchandise shop on the middle floor. We've made 17 new T-shirts, which include a few. You better start selling those plushies in the online shop. We've created a range of 24 enamel pins. You'll have found a random one in your swag bag. If you approach me and I'm wearing a pin, feel free to swap for the one you've got if you'd like. Happy to trade. We can purchase, you can purchase the others in the shop. As mentioned before, there's also the super exclusive Mirror of Calandra pin that is only available to winners of the card game. Maybe you're able to trade for a full set. There are two new posters. One is the Atlas Passive Tree, 
and the other is the periodic table of currency. <laughs> <laughs> I want that. In addition to reprinting the incredibly popular Celestial Cat socks, we've also introduced the Chaos Orb socks, better for business meetings. There's also a range of four desk pads to keep your play area tidy. You can check them out at the demo zone. We have a limited range of Exocon 2019 merchandise available. I want the Sans Bitter well. plush. Sure early if you want some of this, because stocks of the older items are quite limited. We have plenty of new merchandise for everyone, though, and I think I might have underestimated that. The Exocon livestream concludes tomorrow with our grand racing finale, where four players compete for up to $10,000 and the title of Exocon 2023 racing champion. Afterwards, we're hosting an after party at 8 p.m. at the venue. If you're watching from home, please note that because there are multiple things going on at the same time here, and we can only stream one of them live, we'll be restreaming three of today's talks tomorrow before the event starts. So to be clear, they're occurring here, people can watch them in person, but you can't watch them at that time because we're streaming something else. So we're going to restream those tomorrow in the three hours where it's way too early to do it in New Zealand, but you can watch them online from the States and Europe. This makes sure that everyone is fully up to date on all of the talks that have been announced about Path of Exile 2 before the important Q&A in the morning where you get to ask the important questions. If you missed out on attending Exocon this year, we'll be at Gamescom in Germany in August and PAX West in Seattle in September. At both shows, the Path of Exile 2 booth will have our Exocon demo available to play and a small team of Grinding Your Games developers, including me and Jonathan, to chat to, and we hope to see you there. Thanks so much for joining us this weekend at Exocon 2023. Have a great show, everyone. Dude, I am so hyped. I am so hyped about this. Oh, that's so cool. G'day, Exiles. Welcome back to the second half, the post stall cast. For you, I'm Ziggy D, joined by once again by Mathel, Rise QT, and Noogie. And we're gonna have a bit of a chat about what. We're oh man! Oh, I am so hyped about this. But oh my God, they took the complicated ARPG and made it more complicated. How'd they even do that? Oh, I don't know if that's a good idea from the perspective of getting new players, but it'll definitely make some uh, some long-term players happy. Oh my god, I'm going to play the shit out of Path of Exile 2. I want to... The, uh, the Hall of the Ancestors League, I'm definitely going to play some of that. That's cool. Um, I haven't played enough Path of Exile in quite a while. That's cool. I'm looking forward to that. Um, god damn. Alright, well. I am hyped. That's awesome. Oh, I'm going to have to find a mirror and spend and use the mirror so I can have mirror charges. Oh, mirrors are going to go up in price immediately. Because they're going to get taken out of circulation. Oh, I'm going to watch PUE.Ninja and see how much mirrors go up in price. <laughs> oh, they're going to be so unattainable. Holy shit. Oh my god. Oh. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today. Um, I am excited. Holy shit. Oh my god. I'm going to have to find out what that hideout is. Maybe I can buy it off somebody for 50 bucks or whatever. Buy their code. Oh, I want it. Um, but yeah, that'll be it for today. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.